Big handouts this week. Hopefully we can get through everything. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for our morning. Uh, Lord, thank you for Pastor Graham's message today. Lord, I pray that some people heard that message and accepted uh, you as their Lord and Savior. I hope so. Jesus, uh, I pray for all of us, though we would come to draw closer to you in understanding who you are, Lord, and your word today. Lord, all of us, all of us are a little like Nicodemus, Lord, and we've got our own thing going on in our head, and you want to break through that, Lord, to give us your word and uh, to have us draw closer to you on the life that you make for us, Lord Jesus. So let us be good hearers today, Lord, good listeners, and we pray in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, let's get going. This is, uh, there's a lot of stuff here in this today. Um, Partly for the simple reason that we're, uh, we're dealing with kind of two dimensions when we come to the Gospels. Some, some people uh, in, uh, talking about interpretation talk about two levels in the Gospels. Because on the one hand, you've got what Jesus actually said and did. But then on top of that, you've got four different people who have an agenda. And the agenda is always ministry and trying to bring the good news to the people that they're ministering to, but they're ministering in different parts of the Roman Empire. They're talking, they're they're bringing their story to different people. And uh, and so their, their agenda varies a little bit. And so first we need to understand a little bit more about that, as, especially if you're really digging into one of the Gospels. You, you need to have sort of a picture in your mind about what that ministry objective is for that author. But then secondarily, we want to just talk about Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and wh- how and why he teaches the way he does. And everything that we've come through leading up to this point and studying through the Old Testament is prepare, has prepared us for that because he speaks with the wisdom of the wisdom literature. He speaks with the, with the poetic language of the Psalms. He speaks with the piercing words of the prophets here in, in really the greatest of the prophets, Jesus. So, so all of this is going to make a lot of... And he's speaking to a disobedient people primarily. Primarily speaking to Jewish people that are coming from the kind of mindset that the prophets were speaking to. So as we lead up through this, we're really prepared for why he does what he does. And then secondarily, he's speaking to us. But if we understand how he's speaking to them, we're a much, it's much easier for us to hear his word for us. We'll think, oh, that's why he talks that way, you know, to these people. And then the secondarily, then we think, well, yeah, now I can hear him even more clearly when I understand that. So that's what we're talking about. So we've got these two levels. That's how everyone talks about the Gospels. Two levels. So I want to first start talking about the Gospels themselves. And, uh, and here I say, let me see, I'm get to the right slide. So uh, we've got four more, four more um, uh, meetings here after this one, par- parables next week. So we're going to focus in specifically on the parables because they're kind of their own can of worms. We're going to talk about that. I, I love the parables. I'm excited that. Then Acts, then Epistles. Then we're going to get to the book of Revelation, apocalyptic literature at the end of the series. Okay, so I want to start this way. I want to say the relationship between the Gospels is complicated. And I want to point this out, not because, it, I, and I, some of you are already well aware of this, but I'm going to say this just, and I want to walk through this just for a minute for people who maybe haven't had a lot of um, training or insight given to them from maybe that time you first read the Gospels when you were in Sunday school as a teenager, as a, as a young person, and then you get up later on and you start looking at the Gospels and you're like, what's going on here? They, they don't always line up well. And it can be a little troubling. And then there are people that have exploited this out in the world to try to make an argument that the Gospels are actually contradictory, that some of them are, have falsehoods in them uh, because they don't line up and they report differently. So I want to talk about this. It's called the synoptic problem. And it's not a problem at all. It's really not at all. But I want, to, I want to give you a picture in your mind so as you come to it, you understand that the differences between the Gospels are really, 
are really powerful and are something that we can gain a lot from, that we don't just have one unified viewpoint. The early church could have easily taken these and harmonized them and made them all one big book, worked out all the little you know, differences between them and given us one document, uh, and that's absolutely not what they wanted to do. Each of these is inspired independently by the Spirit, and the Spirit works differently, worked differently through these in different communities and for different target audiences in the first century, and we, he continues to speak to us uh, through these differences. So I, just, I picked here on the calling of Matthew just to kind of show you the differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is a whole different ball of wax. I'll talk about him a little bit later, but, but the whole different. But these three were all writing, uh, rel- we think, relatively early in the first century, within 20 years of the crucifixion, resurrection. They're writing these Gospels. And, uh, and, and there are differences, and we're trying to make, why are there differences? So we see in Matthew, for example, yeah, this is the calling of Matthew. And notice in Matthew's gospel, we actually get the name Matthew uh, for this tax collector that Jesus calls. And, uh, and then we get some extra information. We get that Matthew followed him, very simple, and that he went to a house at, at that point where there were many tax collectors and sinners present, dining with Jesus. Very simple account, actually, in Matthew. But now look at Mark. Mark, As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Mm, Why doesn't it say Matthew? Why is his name different in Mark's account? Okay, it's one of the reasons why we know Matthew, the guy who was the disciple Matthew, wrote Matthew. He, in writing this, in recording the story, put the name down that he went by in the ministry of Jesus. And perhaps, because the name Matthew means gift of God, maybe Jesus gave him a new name like Peter. We can just maybe hypothesize, but he's not going to go back and put his old name in when he's writing about himself. He's going to put the name that was the, his name as a follower of Jesus in. And so, but his original name was Levi, and so that's what we get from Mark and Luke. We get that original name. So that's just one of those little clues, little hints that we're reading, really reading the tradition that he wrote that gospel really is him. And notice that it was the beautiful house that he invited all these people to. It was his house. House, but he leaves that out because he doesn't want to make people think that he's about any of that anymore, right? Because he and we know here in Luke that he gave up everything and followed Jesus. So he gave that house up. That's what we know from Luke. But he doesn't want to mention that, right? Because that's that's talking about himself. He doesn't want to do that. He's drawing all attention to Jesus. So we that's one of the, for example, passages whereby we even though he didn't write in there, this is me writing this right now, we he's basically telling us that. It's very interesting. But notice just some of the different things that the words change a little bit. Some of the there's extra little insights on some of them. Luke takes the reclining at the table and puts it at the end of this sentence construction. He moves it from the beginning to the end. Luke doesn't have any. He, there, there is obviously some connection, literary connection between them. What is it? Okay, and there's been, oh my gosh, so many books and speculation about what that is. All substantially, though, you're going to look at it, it's the same message, but with some important little decisions. Notice Luke. Luke, who's actually, his, his target audience are, are Gentiles. Notice he doesn't call them sinners in his account. He just calls them other people, right? He leaves that out. The word sinners is a very Jewish word. Calling people sinners is a very Jewish thing to do. And so uh, Ma- Mark recorded it that way, and I, I think I can explain why. Matthew is writing specifically to Jews, and so he keeps the word in. It's very meaningful for them. Luke smooths it out by putting in a word that m- will make more, by putting in a construction that makes more sense to the people that are reading his gospel, right? Same thing but doesn't feel constrained to use the same word, okay? And so this is kind of takes us to the point of all this, which, how, what do we do with that? Um, okay, and I'll, I'll give you a thought about that here in a sec. Let me, uh, let me get down here. Second point, and Graham made this point in the talk, Jesus didn't write these Gospels. If we had the writings of Jesus, they would probably look like the prophets, right? If he had just written, he wouldn't have put in the story, now I went here, now I went there. Um, But because we need the stories, because we need to know how the teachings related to the places that he was and the people he was speaking to. So it's really wonderful that God uh, instead chose to 
uh, create the Gospels from these people that came to know Jesus. And they're, they're really giving their testimonies in each of these. You know? that, I mean, that's part of what they're doing. They're explaining how they came to know who he was. And th- uh, as they write the story, you see that sort of unfolding. Uh, Jesus did not write the Gospels. They include his teachings interspersed between narratives, but each author has a ministry objective in how they organize their Gospel. We have in our culture today, you know, have you seen all these high profile like mur- murder cases and things that are happening right now? Is it just crazy what's happening? And we watch that and we want to know how, how did these murders happen? As we're trying to figure out, is this person lying right now? And, and we're sort of tracking through the details and, you know, this person saw him at this time and this cell tower got his phone at this. And it's, it's all a bunch of these. And we're sort of assembling this picture to try to figure out if we can put together an explanation that makes sense so that we can convict these people and throw, throw them in jail or whatever, or give them the death penalty. We're trying to figure it out. Our minds today are like that. Did we get video? Do we have audio? How, how, is there testimony? Are they varying in their testimony? We're looking for, the, we have this level of criterion in the way that we analyze data to solve problems today that means nothing to these people. They don't think this way. That's not the point of it. Nobody here is worried about whether anybody thinks whether what they wrote is accurate or not. They're not thinking that way. They're simply telling a story. So as I was thinking about this, I thought I'd come up with an analogy, and it's probably not a good analogy, but I'm just going to throw it at you, okay? So like, imagine I was going with my young adult Uh, older teen kids to Disneyland and maybe we're planning to go to Disneyland and and Debbie decides she doesn't want to go okay for whatever reason she's got other stuff to do she's tired whatever she decides not to go so I say okay I'll tell you about it when I get back so we go to Disneyland and we spend the day there and I've got my son and he's got his own plans about what he wants to do but we're mostly grouped up because we like hanging out together my daughters are doing certain things now you can imagine the day especially one of my daughters is in a bad mood because her boyfriend didn't get to come with us Uh, And so she's thinking about how different her day would have been if she'd had the boyfriend there. So she's got this thought in her head. You know, the other daughter's impatient, doesn't like waiting in lines, has a different kind of experience. My son, at times, maybe he even breaks away. He's like, I'm going on Space Mountain, uh, you know, three times today. You know, I'll I'll meet up with you guys at, you know, I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip Small World, you know, something like that. (laughs) I mean, why wouldn't you, right? If you're, if you're a dude, you know, a 17-year-old guy. So, so anyway, you look at the whole thing. Okay, so then imagine we kind of get back at the end of the day, and I've got my own thing going on, right? And I get back, and we're driving back in the car. Maybe we're all kind of talking about our day. And I'm listening to how my kids share about the parts. I go, what, what, was the, what were your highlights of the day? And I'm listening to you know, them share them. And, and so I'm kind of getting their story framed in my mind as I'm thinking about my own experience of the day. Mostly we were there at the same time doing the same things, but I think it's very interesting how we kind of look at things a little bit differently. And of course, I, I'm going to have a lot of different experiences different from them. Then we get back. Okay? So imagine my kids are doing something. I walk back in and I'm talking to Debbie. And she's like, oh, tell me about your day. And, and now I got a couple agendas that I have to manage, right? One agenda is I don't want her to feel too bad about what she missed, right? Because I, I don't want to, so as I'm explaining my day, I'm like, should I, I don't want to tell her how much fun I had. So maybe I'll tell her more stories about what a hassle it was, you know? I'll, tell, I'll throw some of those in so that she feels good about not going. But then on the other hand, I want her to go next time. So I got to think, I got to like also focus a little bit on the things that I know. And, and I was in the gift shop and it was awesome, right? And I'll tell her all about that. Because, and then next time she'll think, oh yeah, I got to go to the gift shop next time I'm there. So I want her to come with us. So I have an agenda, okay? And my agenda is true. And the way I explain my day to her, I'm not necessarily giving her things in the order they happen. I'm not necessarily giving all the context. I might pull something out of there and uh, throw something in my, some, some weird thing my son said in the middle of telling some other different story that was happening during the day because it made me think about what he said. And I'm delivering it all to her. So now, am I giving her a false picture? No. No, I'm giving her the picture. It's all accurate. But I'm not setting it up like a court case, right? That's not my agenda. So my agenda is, is personal, and I want her to like, feel like, okay, I feel like I was there with you, uh, but I don't feel too bad I didn't go, but you know, I do want to go next time. I'm like, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I want, right? 
Okay, now, now imagine then my son comes in and I'm up taking a shower and my son comes in and she's like, oh, tell me, you tell me about your day. And he's, he's got a whole nother thing going on as he's explaining it. But probably the highlights of our days, because we talked about him in the car together, he hits the same highlights. And so he's sharing some of the same stories he, I, and my daughters were sharing in similar way we describe them. But then he's filling on all kinds of other gaps because he's got a whole different agenda. Then imagine my, my daughter comes in and she's spending a lot of time talking about all the places where she, she went and had fun but would have been more fun if her boyfriend were there. Like She spends a lot of time talking about the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Because it's dark and I could have been kissing him there. But she doesn't... <laughs> She doesn't put that in, but she's spending a lot of time talking about this. And you're like, why are you spending so much time talking about the Pirates of the Caribbean? Well, that's what she was thinking about all day, right? So, so all this to say, all this to say, this is what we have when we come to the Gospels. We have traditions. We have things that were, were undoubtedly written down, but a lot of this stuff was oral for probably almost 20 years. The, uh, maybe they were writing some pieces of this down early, but parts of it were just told over and over. Peter, you can picture this guy, telling the stories of Jesus over and over and over. The things that he remembered that were powerful to him are the things, he's a kind of an action figure, you know, Peter. So he's, his, you can just imagine his stories, and then we went here, and then we went here, and then we went here, you know, and it was all just to show the power of Jesus. And then, you know, and then I turned away from Jesus because I didn't know who he was, really. And then I figured it all out, right? And you can just imagine his story and all these other people hearing his story over and over and over. Do they necessarily, are they reading it written down? No, they've heard it a million times at this point. And so then when these things all come together and they're collated and like we need to record these because maybe some of the apostles were getting old. Some of them had already, they'd already had some apostles that had been put to death by Herod earlier on. Maybe they're thinking, we need to write all this down if we haven't already started doing it. And they probably started doing it pretty early. And then ultimately it's all collected. So what you're going to have are the kind of differences that I was showing you up there. And when you look at them, when you look at them, none of these are important. They're not. And they, these honor the different objectives. These honor the individual personalities of the people and their, and their perspective. Now, is there some relationship between them? Definitely. And I'll, I'll give you my thoughts about it. And there's a lot of debate about it. I'll give you my thoughts and why they're very close, but why they're not exact and why at some points they're pretty different. Um, and I think I can explain that. They all had different objectives, these people. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, though, it's not a factual, true-false issue. It's about how they decided to present the information to lead people to the Lord. That's, that's what it's all about. Third problem in all this, and this kind of explains, too, why there's some small variances in the way people say things. Jesus didn't, for the most part, speak in Greek. He spoke in Aramaic. That was the, his primary language that he grew up in. Aramaic, it's different than Hebrew, it's different than Greek, uh, and that would have been, the, that is the language of Israel in this time frame. Uh, and, he, and, and all this to say, it looks, it's got some similarities to Hebrew, it's, it, it's very, very different from Greek. Greek is a very complex, grammatically complex language that was the language of the Roman Empire because Alexander the Great and his empire mandated the teaching of Greek language and culture throughout all the conquered peoples that he had. And that stuck. And when the Romans, when he died and the Romans came in, they maintained that. They already had a base for communication. The Romans themselves knew Greek as a second language on top of uh, Latin. And so everybody sort of had their primary language, but everybody spoke some Greek. Uh, even if it's small amount. Uh, and, and so when you're writing something down, especially when you're writing something that's going to be uh, pushed out through the Roman Empire, you're going to write it in Greek. And Greek's, again, very complicated and very expressive. So going from Aramaic into Greek is not difficult. You're going to be able to find the right words in Greek. However, how you write them kind of depends on the interpreter. Uh, so they, uh, somebody might pick a different word for fish. If in, the, if in Greek there's three different words for fish, uh, they might pick a different word than another person who's translating something, a parable, a story, or something like that into Greek. 
But Jesus did not speak in Greek. We know he spoke Greek because at times in the Gospels where he's talking to people that wouldn't have spoken Aramaic at all, like Pilate, he, there's no interpreter. He's speaking directly to Pilate. So he would have then been speaking in Greek. All of this is invisible to us reading it, but we know he did speak it. We also know Jesus spoke Hebrew and read Hebrew because Jesus in Luke 4 goes into the synagogue and takes down the scroll of Isaiah and reads Isaiah and proclaims it in front of the synagogue. Okay? And people called him rabbi. He wouldn't have been called rabbi if he didn't have some expertise in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, in the original language. So he had to have spoken all of them, but his, his primary language was Aramaic. So that means when you get it into Greek, it, it might change a little bit, as, but the sense isn't lost of it. And the writers and the gospel recorders didn't feel the need to worry about whether their translation of what was said into Greek was uh, the same as someone else's. They didn't care. It was all supposed to be just, supposed to be just uh, accurate, but not crazy, perfectly precise, right? They, that wasn't their agenda. Uh, last, I say the gospel writers did not create content, but they had to decide what content to use to fulfill their objectives, and they had a realistic limit on how much content they could include. So understand, these are not people with word processors and who can print thousand page books. These are people who are writing it out on this rolled up papyrus thing. You know, it's a scroll. They make these, they sold them in this time, they're expensive. They had different lengths. There was a max length you could buy. I don't even know, like probably looks like a carpet, you know, it's so big. But, but there was a max length that you would even be able to buy. So as you're starting to write, like the last thing you wanna do is write a book that goes onto a second scroll. Because then all of a sudden, like th that means it's double work or double expense covering it. They all had a realistic amount of room to write in. And they, so they deliberately picked and chose what they were going to put down. So they, they, ha they all had many, many more stories that they could have told if they'd chosen to. Um, Luke and Acts, we'll look at it, they are both, we're looking at this about the same length, they are at the absolute max length we figured out that could fit on a scroll. So really, it really is one book, Luke Acts, but they, he had to break it up. Uh, because it couldn't have fed it all on one scroll. All of them were under some constraint like that. that this, thus you get to the end of John, and John comments, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have had room for the books that would be written. That's, that's called hyperbole. We'll talk about that. He doesn't literally mean that, but he means we were with this guy for several years, and we had so many conversations, so many things that were explained to us, so many things that happened. And Mark, in his gospel, has a lot of action and very little teaching. Then you get to John, John fills it in with tons of teaching, very little action. So they, they all had to pick and choose. That's why John didn't feel the need to include all the stuff that had been written in earlier gospels. He, he undoubtedly wrote afterward and knew what was in them, and it deliberately chose to fill in some gaps in his gospel that were left out of the, of the synoptics. Okay, so let me quick just, I, I want to talk a little bit about the agenda. Um, actually, Graham highlighted a little bit about them today, but I want to make a couple points and maybe throw out a couple ideas you've never heard before about some of the Gospels that are a little bit more, um, like t take a step out looking at the Gospel, try to figure out what's going on. Uh, pretty much all the Gospels had the agenda to show that Jesus was the Messiah. They all have that agenda. Uh, because that's the main thing about Jesus, right? And it was the thing that everybody was asking, is he the Messiah? That everyone was trying to figure that out at the time. So they all are going to, one of the agendas that they all have is to show that, yes, he was. That, that is first and foremost, and you could put that down for all of them. Um, Mark does this very interesting thing, though. Mark uh, rolls out the information about Jesus in a way where he focuses on uh, Jesus as a miracle worker who had to die. And one of the big theses that is out today about why Mark wrote what he did is, is this understanding of how crucifixion was viewed in the first century by the people in, in the Roman Empire. Crucifixion was the most shameful way anybody could die. So when you, when you say somebody was crucified, the immediate thought is they were probably a horrible criminal, scumbag, 
That's the way they would think in their time. And they live in an honor-shame society. That is the most shameful way to die. So one of the big theses that's out right now, and this is in Gundry's uh, intro to the New Testament and in his commentary on Mark, is that Mark's gospel was principally, the agenda was to show that this was supposed to happen. Jesus, Jesus deliberately hid his, hid his Messiahship so that he would go to the cross, that, and he was, in fact, powerful over the physical world. He did miracles. He could have easily avoided death, but he didn't. It was an intentional and therefore not a cause for shame. And so this famous passage from Mark 8 is then one of the central points of the gospel where uh, he starts telling them that he's going to be killed, and Peter says, Lord, no, and he gets rebuked. Get behind me, Satan. Okay, you, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, so he's addressing this misconception. This is not a cause for shame. This is the way salvation is accomplished through this apparently shameful death. Um, so who was Mark? So Mark was, uh, by church tradition, we know it was John Mark, who was the companion of Paul in Paul's first missionary journey. Then in his second missionary journey, Mark was a flake. And Paul refused to take him and said, I want a different guy. And Barnabas said, no, we're bringing Mark again. And so Paul and Barnabas broke up and went different directions in the second missionary journey. Paul ends up with Silas, a Hellenistic Jew. And, uh, and Mark, uh, John Mark ends up going, hang, going with Barnabas on wherever his ministry took him at that time. Mark, we know from 1 Peter 5, is with Peter at the very end of Peter's ministry in Rome. Okay, so, now, so because of that, we, we have concluded that this gospel, which is heavy on narrative, heavy on miracles, more miracles recorded than any other gospel, uh, and, and, and a light on teaching because of the agenda that Mark is writing undoubtedly in Rome. He's together with Peter. The stories that he's recorded are Peter's stories, and he is distributing them to show that this was all planned. And this idea, have you ever heard the, the phrase messianic secret in Jesus? It's this idea that Jesus to told everybody throughout Mark's gospel, don't tell people. When they're like, you're the Messiah, he's like, shh, you know, don't tell anybody. And even when he cast demons out, he, he had to silence them uh, when they started to talk. But he would heal people and say, don't tell anyone. This is Mark's gospel. He, that he puts this, he reminds us of this over and over through his gospel. Uh, because Jesus had to go this direction. Yeah, he couldn't have been elevated to king. It wasn't that he tried to be king and didn't make it. He deliberately tried to keep it as quiet as possible so that he would end up going to the cross. So this is the idea behind Mark's gospel. I'm starting with this one because the, 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 the dominant theory today is that Mark's gospel was written first, which you'd expect as Peter, kind of the central person in, in, uh, in the church at this time, and that his gospel was used by Luke and Matthew. Okay, so, the, so they had it in some form. Uh, they either had it in actual written form, or they had just heard the stories from Peter a hundred times. That, that actually is a really good explanation, but they had the content of Mark's gospel. Matthew uses over 90% of Mark's gospel in his gospel. Why would he do that? Saved him work. He probably, you know, respectful of, you know, the, the, the Peter and his perspective, probably heard it over and over. That just became listening to it. His framework for as he was thinking about the ministry. But then he fills into it a ton of other teaching content that is not in Mark. So we'll talk about that. This, this is, we know Luke in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Luke mentions his gospel. Luke was not an eyewitness. His, his gospel is written from eyewitness accounts, he makes clear. So, so it's pretty obvious that one of those is Peter's account that Luke uses. Okay? So the gospel of Mark is really the gospel of Peter through Mark, is what it is. Uh, based, and we know that based on church tradition and then based on a lot of features in the gospel where Peter particularly is shown to be a failure. And that's how Peter talked about it. Yeah, he didn't make himself a hero in the gospel. He was this guy, right? He was this guy. 
And that's one of our signs. The other Gospels actually speak much more highly of Peter than Peter's own stories about himself. Okay, so that's Mark. So as you're reading it, think about that. Mark's writing to people in the Roman Empire, this expanding Gentile church that needs to know Jesus was this guy that Jewish religion uh, prophesied, um, but that the fact that he died was in fact the victory and not a cause for shame. Okay, now we get to Matthew. Matthew has a different agenda. Matthew is more is writing, they, probably writing at that point from Antioch, which was this hub of Christianity in, this, in the first century. He had undoubtedly fled Jerusalem with the other apostles who didn't want to get killed by Herod. And it ended up, by church tradition, we think in Antioch, where there was a, a strong mixture of both Jewish and Gentile Christians together. And Matthew's really writing with this idea of trying to show the Jews that Jesus was this prophesied king from, uh, from ancient times, that he was, he was in the lineage of David, and that this is the guy that we've always been looking for. Um, the, here's some reasons why we are pretty sure that's what's happening. Not, so it's not that his gospel isn't also for Gentiles, but, but those people are going to accept it on a certain level already, but Jews might have an expectation in a, a king who would actually reign, and Jesus didn't actually reign. And so he's trying to show, nope, he was always supposed to be this way. He was supposed to be the suffering servant. He is the one that we were always waiting for. And you can see, because there's 11 times in Matthew's gospel that this unique phrase appears, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Uh, and he uses it He uses it 11 times. I've given you two examples here where he quotes Isaiah in reference to look back. Um, this is Matthew's extra insight inserted into the teaching of Jesus to make it clear, in other words, to the person hearing this, because normally this is being read to an audience, the gospel, and he's making it clear to them. By the way, he's helping them to understand either if they're Gentiles or specifically, though, if they have Jews, you know, that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. He does this over and over and over. It's clearly his agenda. We don't see this kind of thing happening in Mark. This was not important to Mark's listeners. Doesn't mean Mark didn't know about this. It meant Mark's listeners didn't really care too much about what the prophet Isaiah said about Jesus. It wasn't a critical part of Mark's agenda in writing and doing ministry. He, he's thinking, how do I get these Romans to you know, want, be interested in Jesus, and it's a different agenda than Matthew. So Matthew is, is mentioning things that are really important to the people that he's ministering to. Um, with the arrival of the king also comes the need to live out the morals of the kingdom and not focus on superficial religiosity. So Matthew's got also in, in mind the idea of kind of the, 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 the situation of the people of Israel that Jesus was coming into, He's like, hey, we, you know, not putting you know, wine, new wine and old wine skins, trying to kind of break out of this misconception that a lot of Jews have into this new perspective here that Jesus has brought uh, with his death and resurrection, trying to show that. that this, again, not going to be real important to most Gentiles reading about this, but it's going to be very powerful to Jews who think that their religion is all they really need to worry about. So you can see just, and you just see that popping up all over Matthew. Uh, very important. Uh, and then third, the coming kingdom is in fulfillment of God's promise to bring salvation to the world. So at the end of his gospel, this, this idea that Gentiles are involved is exactly what you expect in the ministry of Jesus after the resurrection uh, in the Great Commission, because it was prophesied uh, from the beginning that, that he, the Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles. And here it is, Matthew lets it. So he's tying it into the, the larger fellowship of Gentiles by wrapping up his gospel that way. You can see why that would be real important to him in a mixed church, right, who's being persecuted. Uh, so he's, he's, it's a witness to the Gentiles who are not yet Christians and an encouragement, uh, a witness to the Jews who are not yet Christians and, a, and, a, and also a, an encouragement to the Gentiles who have stumbled into you know, some of this persecution that they'd never experienced before. Jew, Jew, the Jews were well used to that, but not the Gentiles, and so he brings them all together there at the end in encouragement. Here's the interesting thing about Matthew. It, it follows this really interesting organization. Matthew had an organizational agenda in how he presented the material he had. He's, he's got the basic framework of Mark, 
but he has these five long teaching sections that he inserts between narrative. Uh, and so if you look at it, it's, it's clearly very intentional to get focus on these. Doesn't necessarily mean things happen. He taught all these at any one time. But again, that's not his agenda is to set a strict chronology of these things, but to minister to people by presenting the information in a way which will be powerful for them. So he groups a lot of these teachings that are not in Mark. Sermon on the Mount, Commissioning of the Apostles, Parables of the Kingdom, Relationships within the Kingdom, and then the Olivet Discourse here at the end, which is, which is in Mark and Luke, it is. But he groups it into its own special section, you know, with extra detail that's going to be very powerful to uh, Jews and Jewish Christians. Okay, Luke. Luke is, like Graham said, was probably a Gentile, probably the only book in the Bible that was written by a, a, a written entirely by a non-Jew, Luke and Acts. Luke and Acts, uh, point three, it, they're parts of a larger work. And really, the, the difference there is he had to split them up. There weren't scrolls long enough to put the entire thing on one scroll. So in other words, you're going to look at Luke through the lens of Acts. You, you see even more of his agenda unfold in Acts. You have to understand Luke is the backstory to that. So he's writing predominantly to, um, it's a mixed church obviously, but predominantly to Gentiles in his, in his gospel. And so he, if you look at it and understand what he's showing in Acts with the, with the expansion of the kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit, then he needs to explain it was always coming this way. Jesus always intended to reach the Gentiles. Jesus always intended to reach the lost, the people that were outside the bounds of traditional Jewish religion. Uh, and so that's, an, that's my point too. He highlights the universal aspects of Jesus' ministry. It, there's a lot of this. The story of Zacchaeus, all the tax collectors, all of those people are highlighted in the book of Luke in a way. Uh, Luke has to explain more of the Jewishness of uh, Jesus' ministry. He'll put in little extra bits to explain it because his readers don't necessarily understand all of that. Uh, and then he'll trim out some parts that would have been more helpful for uh, Jews. Because again, most of his readers weren't Jews. You can see it in his writing. Here's Simeon. Notice Simeon in Luke 2. Mentioned specifically, he highlights that. Why does he tell the story of Simeon? Because it, it actually supports Luke's ministry objective. And again, if he had you know, 10 scrolls worth of material to use, this is one of the stories he's got to include. That, you know, Simeon recognizes that Jesus was a, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Uh, and that here in Luke 3, all people will see God's salvation. The, these quotes are all over Luke's gospel. He's trying to show that Luke, uh, or the, the gospel that preceded the book of Acts, all the, the ministry of Jesus, was always intended after the resurrection to reach out and impact uh, the entire world, everybody who was outside the margins of traditional Jewish religion. Okay, so that takes us to John. John was probably written later. It's, it's, it, uh, I think, and I think most people believe, most scholars believe that John had already many times heard Peter's stories probably had heard the other Gospels read at different points, knew what they had, and knew what they didn't have. And so when John comes to, to writing his Gospel, he's deliberately adding information that serves his agenda that specifically isn't in those other ones. Uh, the other people didn't have a problem with a, like, a lot of overlap, because they were in different places writing for different audiences and they, Mark gave them Peter's gospel was a good framework. John deliberately uh, fills in critical gaps. In some places he gives us information about things that are puzzling in the synoptic gospels, almost like he knew we'd be thinking, how did Peter get into the inner courtyard there? That's weird. And then he explains, oh, a slave girl came out and let him in. And you're like, why did you tell us that information? It must have been because he's probably been asked. You know, he heard that question asked, how did Peter get in there? And he explains it in his gospel. Also in the synoptics, for example, there's only one Passover feast mentioned in the synoptic gospels which if that is the only Passover, then you think maybe Jesus 
Jesus' ministry was a little over a year, right? So in, in John's gospel, uh, he highlights at least three different Passovers, maybe four. So it's because of John's gospel, and I think he deliberately does this, we understand that Jesus' ministry was at least three years long uh, because of that. And so it's very powerful and helpful that John gave us that. So he expresses the purpose of his gospel near the end of the gospel, and um, uh, Graham read this in the message today. But it, it is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and I said that's the number one point in all the gospels, and then also the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So it's evangelistic. Um, John is writing almost uh, in, intentionally. He, we think John is in Ephesus writing this, uh, later in, under a situation of persecution, um, and I said, he therefore reveals the nature and object of saving faith. His message would be most compelling to Hellenistic Jews. Hellenistic meaning Greek-born Jews. Jews who are, don't grow up in Palestine, but who are out uh, in the Roman Empire uh, that, that speak Greek. His, his gospel would speak the most strongly to those people. But, but obviously, it's going to be powerful to anybody that's reading. Um, second, his gospel was probably written later, I said this, because he doesn't use sources other than his own recollection. And it's probably he found the earlier gospel insufficient for his purpose. He's got a different purpose. The earlier gospels don't re clearly reveal Jesus as the Son of God. They reveal it, but it's a little bit more woven in. Jesus forgives sins. Jesus does certain things that only God could do, but th there isn't as many direct proclamations. Uh, uh, you know, outside of maybe Peter's, there's very little in there where you get the, the, the whole understanding of that. He, that was really important to John, writing much later on to, to explain that, no, Jesus was God. That, that, let, let me like, just make this really clear. It's a very important part and, and objective in his gospel. Uh, three, a key theme in his gospel is the idea that everybody missed the significance of who Jesus really was during his ministry. But in reflection, this was by design. Jesus spoke to inspire faith in those who could finally recognize and trust in him. So we're going to take a look at John 3 here in a second, the, the passage that Graham spoke on in the context of John's objective in this gospel. But notice a couple of these statements throughout the gospel. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So John's got a lot of this thinking back and helping us understand that a lot of people missed this. He, John's saying, I missed it. I was right there with him, and I didn't know who it was. I thought, oh, is this the Messiah? And it was so much bigger. That's what John's telling us. And we all figured that out. And by the way, I'm writing now, you know, 50, 60 years after the resurrection, and it's so clear now. And in the life of the church, they were all talking about Jesus as God. You find it all the way through Paul's writings. You find it in 1 Peter. It's very clear. But at the time, he's saying during the Gospels, and maybe in some of those early Gospel stories that were recorded in the synoptics, it, it wasn't so obviously clear to everybody who we had when we had Jesus here. And so John looks back with that thought. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. This is John 12. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him, right? All of a sudden, the lights went on. So John's gospel is to write because he wants the lights to go on with you. See, that's what he wants. See, now, from where we're at, we see it all, and hopefully you see it too. Uh, and that's, what, that's his goal. And therefore, you know, trust in him as the Son of God. And he uses some Old Testament symbols to reveal that Jesus is the Son of God. These are, a lot of these symbols are in the Old Testament. They're specifically connected to, uh, to God. Or, and sometimes they were taken to refer to the entire nation of Israel. Jesus repurposes them for himself. So you just see all of this unfolding. Jesus was clearly pointing the way. John's picking material that shows this. Of all the stories he had to rely on, that's why he skips most of them. Well, why does he mention the feeding of the 5,000 and not a lot of the other miracles? Well, because he needs the feeding of the 5,000 as a transition to Jesus' discourse that he's the bread of life. So that's why that particular miracle is in all the Gospels, because it serves John's purposes. John just decided for length of all this to leave out the stuff that didn't, because he knew the church already had those other Gospels that gave more detail, right? Okay, so now 
that this is the big gospel picture. So as you're reading the gospels, um, and hopefully you'll keep these ideas in mind as you're reading it, just like if you're talking to me after that Disneyland trip, and you understand, like it's gonna, a, a, a lights are gonna go on, right? If I tell you, by the way, the reason I'm telling Debbie it this series of stories and not like, you know, where my son, you know, uh, um, threw a hot dog at somebody because he was mad at them and I left that story out, right? Because it doesn't serve my agenda. That's why we have what we have and that's how the Holy Spirit inspired this and for those specific purposes. And we see that, that the Spirit is, all, is, is not just about recording the facts of Jesus but drawing people into faith in the Lord. So that's why we have what we have. They, they all did that job. Now as we look at them, you know, we're not looking at four objective biographies, but for you know, people who loved the Lord and wanted to draw people into faith in Him. And so that's why we have what we have. Okay, so I'm going to talk now. So now I said there's two levels to the Gospels. The one level is kind of what some people will call the, the horizontal level, uh, where you're, um, or sorry, the vertical level, where you're talking about each Gospel as an individual. Now I want to talk about just the teachings of Jesus across the Gospels. And I, I want to, so now I want to just, let's ignore the agendas. Let's just get into the words of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. And, and like we looked at, and we've just gone through all this in the wisdom literature, and we went through it in the prophets, the Psalms. I, I tried to give you like ways to see what's written so that you understand that the Hebrew mind was dull. I don't know how to say it. That sounds horrible. <laughs> It's, it, we know from the, from the prophet of Isaiah, their, they, their religion was blinding them to the truth, right? And the, what we see in the ministry of Jesus, they ignore the prophets. They live foolishly through the history, and we see that in the narratives. And Jesus is here to pierce through that dullness. And in our lives too, but it's specifically to them. His words are to them. The Gospels are really, in a sense, sort of the culmination of the Old Testament, right? Before the resurrection. So you really see Jesus speaking with the kind of, in, with the kind of um, imagery and uh, approaches that we saw the prophets take, the wisdom literature authors uh, take, all of these. They're all woven into his teaching for the same purpose, trying to get through to people who are not listening and trying to get them to remember things that he's telling them. That's his objective. So as we're reading it, I'm going to point out some of the techniques that he uses to reach these dull people because he can reach us too. Because we're a lot of times, we're just like these people, right? So, okay, so, and the first kind of uh, thing you see throughout Jesus' teaching is overstatement. Okay, this is a technique he uses to get people's attention and disarm them. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, <coughs> yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Okay, now he doesn't actually, he's not telling you to actually hate anybody in this passage. That's not Jesus' agenda. Jesus' agenda is to deal with um, the, the challenges and the things that were keeping people from following him. And one of those things is focusing on yourself, focusing on your family. Families were huge back in this time. That, it was the, the primary way people identified themselves in this time was by their family and then secondarily through the people that, and the social status associated with their family and their people. And so Jesus is saying, but sometimes just their own life, like maybe I'm hyper-focused on myself, you have to be able to walk away from that. And so he, but he doesn't say it that way. He, he uses extreme terms here to shake them up, like, hate my parents, you know? But yeah, if that's what it takes, he's saying, yes, uh, you know, you have to, uh, to be me. You have to let go of everything else. So he uses these exaggerated expressions to break through their, you know, points of resistance. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. He says, it's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go into hell where the fire never goes out. See, don't actually cut your hand off, <laughs> right? Right? So, but you get the point. Can you imagine these people sitting there just like, you know, like him saying something like this? I mean, it's just, it's amazing, the teaching. It just cuts right to the center of this because there's a million excuses why we don't do what God wants us to do. Sometimes the way to get through is to make it, express it in extreme terms where then you have to take a step back and go, okay, I get it. I get it. 
You know, I make excuses, you know, oh God, I have to cheat or I'm never going to be successful in my business. I have to lie to people. He's like, oh, no, you don't. Right. You know, you don't get rid of that because even if it, it's better to lose your business than to be a, a liar and a cheater, because that's you're not going to make it into the kingdom. Right. That, so that'd be our modern of that. Right. So you get the point. OK, N now sometimes Jesus not only says extreme things that are possible, but he sometimes tells us things that are impossible. And it's the same idea. It's, it's so impossible that it causes you to stop and think, oh, uh, I'm really thinking about this wrong. So here he says to them, uh, to the Pharisees, uh, you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Okay, <laughs> they don't actually eat camels. Okay? And it's, you can't swallow a camel. It's impossible. Okay? But they, he gets the point. See how powerful that is, though? N eating gnats, by the way, I against the law. The, uh, eating bugs is impure under the law. He's like, you'll, you'll worry about not eating a gnat, but you know, you'll, you'll do other horribly terrible things because you think the law gives you permission. That's the idea of it. Fake religion. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Okay, you don't have a plank in your eye, right? It's not possible, but it's a powerful image. Uh, again, it's hyperbole. Here, the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is for, to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This is such a difficult statement for people to handle that in the Middle Ages, a, a guy made up a story, which is not true, about there being a way in and out of the city of Jerusalem called the Eye of a Needle that a camel could get through, but it was really hard because he didn't want to make it sound impossible for rich people right, to get in. So they made up this story. There was no such gate. Okay? This is hyperbole. Okay? G G of course it's possible, but it's, it takes an amazing work of God for this to happen, is his idea. And he's, he's saying it this way to make it clear. This is the difficulty we're facing in ministry. People depend on their wealth, and, and it's, it's, it's impossible, it seems like, for this to work out. Um, unless, though he says later on, right after this, he says, though with God, all things are possible. He does end that up, right? So it does happen. But that's his point. It's a hyperbolic statement, and it, it threw people off. I mean, constantly uh, in his ministry, people were hearing these extreme statements, and it was, it was penetrating their res points of resistance with these images. That was important. Here, I want to talk about his use of the word amen. Uh, I uh, put this in. Uh, Jesus uses this, this, he starts sentences with the word amen, which we, gets translated into English as the word truly. But the word is amen, that he says, amen. He says this word oh, as an intro. Nobody else has ever done this. In, in, in all of ancient Judaism, ancient literature, nobody spoke this way. What is it all about? In the Gospel of John, it's always amen, amen. And not even one amen. In John's gospel, he doubles it up. And, he, and we translate that very truly when you see that. But this is a characteristic thing that we see throughout Jesus' ministry. What is it? I think this is Jesus' version of the prophetic, uh, the word of the Lord. Jesus, though, doesn't point, point to the Lord God. Jesus introduces what he is about to say. So this is his signal that God is speaking to you through these words. This is not just somebody's opinion. This is my authority. I'm giving this to you directly. Even prophets couldn't speak this way by telling you that their word was utterly true and dependable. But Jesus could. So this is sort of his prophetic formula. We looked at how the prophets introduced a lot of theirs last time. This is Jesus' prophetic introduction. It's an attention getter. Uh, and as we read it, we, we we're, take it, take it that way. This is God speaking to us through this. Uh, this, is not, this is not just a colorful image. This is something serious that Jesus is trying to make it, it through here. I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Wow. You know, prophetic, it's just a prophetic pronouncement, right? You can just see the power of it. But this, this formula appears all over. And the thing is, in English, we don't really notice it. 
because it's just the word truly. It's kind of like we say in English, like, you know, honestly, you know, throw that on the beginning of something we're saying. Like, nobody should ever say that, by the way. Everything you say should be honest already. But we do say that sort of thing, like, I'm not lying right now when I tell you this. That's not what this means. There's something more powerful going on here with this. Nobody else did this. Do you see that? Like this, I'm sure at first a lot of people were listening to him was like, why is he putting amen at the beginning of his? And then I give you a verse, I think I put it in there from Revelation. I put it into your, uh, into your outline, I don't have it on the slide here. I say, compare this to what he writes in Revelation 3, uh, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? And this is Jesus talking to, to the churches, seven churches. These are the words of the amen. So it's Jesus here isn't saying amen, he is saying he is the amen. He is the truth, right? So, so you just get that sense. It's, it really does, in a very clever way, take you to his divine authority. Uh, it's very interesting. But a recurring feature you look for as you're reading. We're going to look at it here in uh, John 3 in a second. Uh, another thing Jesus does, he does these puns, where he'll use words that have multiple meanings. And a lot of times when he does this, he wants you to think about the different meanings and think about the fact that they are meaning. Sometimes they're just clever. Sometimes they, they do mean two different things. And he wants you to get, like, kind of think about both ideas in the way that he does it. But, you know, here, here he gives the apostle Peter the name Peter. Uh, he gives, uh, it's the apostle Simon, actually. He gives him the name Peter. And then he, so you are and the word Greek is Petros, which is the, a masculinized version of the word Petra, rock. So he says, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so, and so in other words, it's a guy, but it's also the foundation of the church, like a slab. So you're trying to figure out, you know, interesting double play on the word. And in Aramaic, it's even more clear, the word kephos is actually the exact same word that he would have named Peter is the name of a rock in Aramaic. And that's why his name is usually transliterated Cephas. That's the Aramaic version. Paul, when Paul refers to Peter, he always calls him Cephas. So, and that, but that's the Aramaic word for rock. Double play. Very interesting image. Then he said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Je Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. So again, this is a word play on the dead. It's, he's talking to people that are spiritually dead and using that as a way to explain, you know, actually burying dead people. So it's a spiritual versus physical. He uses the word play to highlight both of them. Um, there's a ton, uh, many other times he does this. I just hidden a couple here. Uh, simile. Okay, so similes, we saw these used all over the Psalms and the wisdom literature, a powerful way. The Hebrew mind liked word pictures, and that, that spoke to them very powerfully. And, you know, a lot of times pictures communicate a lot more effectively anyway than, um, uh, than descriptions. So uh, here, the simile, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Uh, therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. So he's calling the disciples sheep. Uh, snakes and doves in different contexts, just to paint a picture for them, right? And the Pharisees and the, and the chief priests as wolves. Um, lots, of, lots of statements like this. And again, just the same sort of thing we saw in, in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus uses the exact same constructs as a regular form of his teaching. Then also metaphor. A, metaf a simile is where you say the word like or as, but a, a metaphor, you, you just leave that out and you just make people things like you're the salt of the earth. Uh, the harvest is plentiful. So the people of there are, are a harvest. Uh, you snakes, you brood of vipers, he calls the Pharisees. Don't you just love that? That's just there's nothing more powerful than that. You could, he could talk all day about why these people are devious and harmful to the people of Israel. But he just, he just nails it in one word right there by calling them snakes. And then he uses it of himself. I am the vine, you are the branches. He uses these images. They, they, they speak very powerfully to the Hebrew mind. And we just anticipate that. Um, just to, that he, he wants to communicate that way and he doesn't need to give us a lot of uh, verbiage to make it through, just like we saw in the Old Testament. And then Proverbs, of course, many of his statements are clearly proverbial. Uh, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
Uh, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. It's like we're reading the book of Proverbs now. All, the, the wisdom of Jesus is, uh, is all throughout his teaching is tucked in. Uh, Paul in the book of Acts remembers one of Jesus' statements that we don't even have in the Gospels. He says, it's better to, like the Lord said, it's better to give than receive. That's a very powerful uh, proverbial statement. It's not even in the Gospels. Somehow Paul, it's one of the things that Paul knew and heard from people uh, that were eyewitnesses that, that we don't even have another a separate record of. We know Jesus said and did many things that uh, haven't been preserved. Uh, Jesus uses a lot of riddles. He, and we're going to look here in a second. I've got to keep going so that we get through this. But he uses a lot of riddles. And uh, he, makes, he says things that it, he's inviting people to figure out what he's talking about. And it's one of the ways that he draws people in. Uh, you know, uh, when he says, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands. And in three days, we'll build another not made with hands. You know, if you just saw in The Chosen, they were like, he's threatening to destroy the temple. You know, but he, of course, he was talking about himself. Uh, in that riddle. He, Jesus uses those all the time. And then paradoxes. He spins things around that sound impossible, but he's inviting you to like, come up with the solution. To, and usually it's to, uh, to show some serious problem in culture or his religious system that in fact it's the exact opposite is the reality for, for God. Like, he says whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Sounds like gibberish until you have the solution to the paradox. Kind of like a riddle. Once you understand what he means, it makes complete sense. Uh, it's just contrary to our normal ways of thinking. He uses a fortiori statements. This is a statement that is like, if this, then how much more? So this, if you believe this much, then how much more is this other greater truth like if if you wouldn't give your uh, your son a stone right if he asks for bread and if you're evil how much more is your father in heaven going to give good gifts to those who ask for him he uses this construction a lot also to build on you're believing this take it to the next level and it, it logically and you you should have great faith in god if you do that uh, irony, he uses irony all over the time where he spins around expectations for people. I'm skipping, I've got to keep going. And then I want to get to the, the key thing that you need to look at in the ministry of Jesus. The key thing you need to understand is his teaching about the kingdom. That it's all about the kingdom for Jesus. That is his message. Uh, he says that this is it. He was put, Mark 1, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That is the good news. So what is the kingdom? We have to have some understanding of this. It is the primary central focus for Jesus' teaching across all four gospels. And here in Luke 4, he says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Okay, so this is really important. Um, and I just want to say, there, there are two terms in the Bible. Matthew generally uses kingdom of heaven, uh, but uh, the kingdom of God is the one that's normally used throughout the gospel writings to talk about the kingdom. They are the same thing. So, and here in Matthew 19, we have this kind of synonymous parallelism like we saw throughout the wisdom literature. Uh, and I could have constructed it that way for you to see. It looks just like something out of Proverbs, but he says it's hard for someone to get rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he immediately flips and uses the term kingdom of God. They're the same thing. So if, the, if that ever pops into your mind, they're describing the same kingdom. Um, and there are, there's a lot of discussion. Is the kingdom something that's here or is it something that's in the future? And as we get to the book of Revelation, that question is going to get really important. Because if you think the kingdom of God is already here, then you're not going to view the, necessarily view the book of Revelation as future. Uh, and there are a lot of people in the church that think the kingdom of God has, has arrived. And here's the problem. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about this in the Bible, and it's, so it's, it's confusing. So I just want to give you a couple. Of, first thing, that I'm going to say the kingdom is a literal earthly fulfillment of God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament. That Jesus is to rule over an actual physical, political kingdom on earth, uh, uh, establishing it and upholding it that it is of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. It is David's throne. 
It's not a spiritual thing. It is a actual physical kingdom. I mean, it's spiritual, but it's physical. It's not the, the kingdom that was promised to Israel is the kingdom we're talking about. This is the reason so many people were confused by Jesus' ministry. Is this the time where Israel takes power again? Um, and in a sense, we, with Jesus, the kingdom was arriving. Um, and he says, now if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So there's a lot of talk like this, like the kingdom of God is here. But there's even more talk about the kingdom of God being in the future. So Jesus has them pray, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Right? It's still coming. We're waiting for it, people. It's not here yet. If it's here, he's not doing the greatest job right now, I got to say. This world is messed up. I know when he comes into the kingdom that it's going to be so much better than what we got right now, right? Okay, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So he clearly is casting this as something that is later on uh, in us. And he says, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He still hasn't had that glass of wine yet, people, because uh, we're going to have it with him there when that day comes, right? Okay, so here's the solution. The solution to this is the kingdom is a process of God uh, moving and working in salvation history. And it is going to be fulfilled. It's not here yet. Jesus is not reigning in the kingdom today. The kingdom is a future kingdom in which he will reign on earth. We're going to read about it uh, in uh, Revelation when we get to that. But uh, the kingdom is developing. But in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, aspects of the kingdom are operative like the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and the, I think this is the best passage to understand this idea. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed which is the smartest of all seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all great plants. It's, in other words, it's a process. It's in process. So it's, it's already here in a sense, but it's not yet here. Okay? So we have aspects of it. We need to live as though it's here, as people of God, but it, he, 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 it won't happen. In, it won't be culminated until Jesus actually returns. That will be the beginning of the actual kingdom and the literal fulfillment of all God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament. Yes? Uh, can you say that uh, when you say that the kingdom of God is already here, it's a kingdom, a personal kingdom. Oh. When it's, it's in your heart, then the kingdom is in you. The, and so the, the yes. people who have the kingdom in their heart might be... Yes, so, so it's possible, because Jesus actually says something uh, uses a construct, there is, and I think I had it actually on that slide. Um, yes. Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. This, that construction in the Greek could be also equally effectively translated, the kingdom of God is in you. Okay? So that, and, and there ha, there's been a lot of debate about it. The, uh, the, I think you're right. The rule of God can be in your life. That's absolutely right. I don't know if that passage is teaching that or not. It's debated. Because the, the Jews didn't talk about it that way. For them, the king, that wouldn't have been understandable to them. The kingdom of God was visible. So this idea that it's invisible, um, outside of the fact that it's visible in Jesus, which clearly seems like that's what he's talking about, that's the big question. But I completely agree with you. That God can reign in our lives, and in that sense, yes, we're already citizens of the kingdom. We're not citizens of this kingdom, people. This one here, this is all going away, right? You know that. We're citizens of the kingdom that's coming. And, uh, and, th and that's, you know, that's what the message of the kingdom is really all about. We're citizens of that. Uh, we're just strangers and exiles in this place. Okay. Okay, so now uh, I want to just step you through. I want to point out some of the things that we've just gone over in the passage today that we were looking at, John chapter 3. Because I think if you, if, if you look at these, just like with the Psalms and the wisdom literature, if you look at the, the, word, the teachings of Jesus with certain eyes, all of a sudden, a lot of his cryptic statements make a lot of sense. So I want to I step through that with you just to, just to show you applied to this. First, John chapter 1 is the backstory for everything in John's gospel that John outlines uh, an understanding that he came to have after the resurrection 
that, and that his entire gospel is basically the story of how this works out, which is the idea of Jesus coming down, people not recognizing who he was. Remember I showed you some verses that's characteristic of his gospel. He came to that which is his own, but his own did not receive him. That's the Jewish people. Yet to as many as did receive him, uh, they became children of God, not through physical descent, natural descent, like because they were Jewish, but because of God's work, God's decision, right? Um, born of God. So now if, we, if you look at John 1 and then let, use it as almost a framework, you'll see every part of his gospel is about some aspect of this um, as we move ahead. So for example, in John 3, Okay, let me just hit you on a couple points. First, background information. He's meeting with a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. By the way, let me hold this up. This is a, a great commentary. This is a, a series called The Pillar, New Testament Commentary. It's for pastors, but you guys can handle it. Uh, there, you don't need, you know what I'm saying? You don't need to know Greek. So anyway, this is a terrific uh, commentary, and it will give you these kind of background pieces of information. I'll leave it up here. If anybody's really interested in serious study, on John, that commentary is really outstanding, by, written by a scholar who, who loves God. Um, so look, so we, we know that Jesus is talking to an expert. This is, and it's important because Jesus is expecting this guy to understand what he's talking about. John's whole gospel is about nobody getting it, really, even John. But here he starts off with this, uh, ironically, this guy who should have understood him if anybody could have, and he doesn't, okay? And it mentions that he came at night, and Graham mentioned, we don't really know what that signifies as far as motivation, but it's interesting that John chooses to mention that fact, that it was at night, because he's already painted this picture in chapter one of the light shining in the darkness and the darkness not getting it, right? So that he mentions night to John, probably that just pictures, that's just almost like a physical picture of this image of ignorance and Jesus trying to break through it as he's uh, talking to this rabbi. He gets down, notice, here's his statement, very truly, amen, amen. He's about to say something very important directly from, uh, from God to Nicodemus here. So we see that construction, we're all prepared. I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Okay, so we have a, we have a, a potential pun or double meaning. See the kingdom of God. So what does he mean? Like, is he talking about himself and the coming of the kingdom? Remember, the kingdom's got two parts. Is it what's happening right now, the first stages of the kingdom, or is it the fulfillment of the kingdom? Well, he means both. You can't, you can't see me. The process in John 1, he, can't, he doesn't know who Jesus is, is, but he also isn't going, nobody's going to see the kingdom in its fulfillment unless this is true of them. So you, already you can see his, the, the, the two aspects of the kingdom, like the ignorance here is that's part of the problem, and then the ignorance where people don't uh, recognize him at the end, that's also the ignorance that he's trying to break through. You've missed the whole process, is the point. Um, second, paradox, riddle, and another double meaning, unless they are born again. What does that mean? So this is the riddle Jesus is telling him, and he's expecting him to understand. And being born a second time, it's a paradox, because you don't, people don't get born two times, you, you, but you get born and then you die. So what does he mean by this? This is very typical Jesus' teaching. It's very powerful. He's got this guy's attention. Um, and notice right here the double meaning. And the word born again, he uses a word. Uh, it's in Greek, it's a word, anothen, that can mean two different things. It can either mean again, like is translated here, and it can also mean from above. Born, so is he saying born again or born from above? Well, Nicodemus understands him as saying born again because that's how he responds. But it's a double meaning. And the spiritual, then he's going to go on and talk about born of the spirit. So born from above actually kind of makes sense. And other places this word appears in the gospel, he clearly means born from above when he uses it. But here it's, it can be either. See, so it's a pun. And, uh, and he, mean, he means both by this. Um, so here, he gave the right to become children of God. Again, we're connecting back. This idea of being a child of God by faith is not anything they understood at this point. This is a new idea. It seems so obvious to us today, 
But at this point in the church, it was, it was revolutionary. The idea of a new, a new birth means a new identity. Wait a minute, no, I'm a Jew. How could I have another identity, right? They, they just, it doesn't make sense. So the, here's the beginning of his pattern of misunderstanding, which is exactly what he was talking about in chapter 1, that they didn't recognize who Jesus was. He says, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Okay, Jesus does the very, very truly again, the amen, amen, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Okay, he's expecting Nicodemus to understand this. Um, and we're going to get down here a little bit, uh, a little bit further. Um, you should not be surprised at my saying, he means because you're the teacher of Israel. You're an expert in the Hebrew text. You should know. You shouldn't be surprised. He, and he reiterates this again later in the passage. What does water in the spirit mean? See, so this is another place where the commentary will help you because sometimes people explain this based on physical birth and spiritual birth, but that wouldn't, that's not how the Jews thought of it. They didn't think about it in terms of like fluids back in this time. In fact, and he's expecting Nicodemus to understand this. Nicodemus isn't a doctor, but Nicodemus is an expert in the law. Jesus is referring him back to Ezekiel 36. This is a powerful passage. It's right before the dry bones uh, prophecy in Ezekiel 37. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So it's, this, is the, this is the kingdom. It's about being freed, permanent freedom from sin. And it's about the indwelling power of the spirit. That's what he means by water and the spirit. It's not first water and then later spirit. He's saying, no, you need to, this. You don't need religion anymore, you know, if you have faith in me. Uh, flesh gives birth to flesh. Now, now he does split that up, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. Let me get down to the next slide. Whoop. Okay, uh, you hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is, there's a simile, with everyone born of the Spirit. The wind is a simile. So again, double meaning, the word pneuma here. The same word in Greek can mean, that means Spirit can mean wind. And he just shifts from them without doing it. In English, we translate it so that you don't see that, that it's, a, a, it's the same word. But he goes, uh, he shifts from Spirit to this like image this metaphor of the wind for the spirit. The wind blows where it pleases. And this is John 1, 13. This, it's not based on human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. In other words, yeah, um, so it is with everyone born of the spirit. In other words, the spirit of God brings people to him, not just simply being physically born into Israel. That's what this is all about, right? Okay, and last... Another, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? He does it again. Very truly, I tell you. Another statement. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Again, that's John 1.11. So the whole opening of John is unpacking this like, confusion process to us. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Uh, that's the idea. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and by that Jesus means the things that he's just been talking about are the earthly things, about faith, and you don't believe. How will then you believe if I speak of heavenly things? That's what's coming next. So verse 12, Jesus is like, you're not even getting, Nicodemus, you're not even getting what I'm telling you about Ezekiel 36 and 37, and you're not getting this. How are you going to believe now what I'm going to tell you, which is this is even a bigger thing out there. No one has gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. He's talking about himself here. This is, this is a reference to Daniel 7.13, the one who comes uh, from the heaven with the clouds of heaven and is given all rule and authority. He's, now, he's pointing him ahead to his ultimate destiny here. Uh, and Nicodemus, Nicodemus didn't even get Ezekiel 36. He's not going to understand that he's using this oblique reference to himself to connect himself to Daniel 7, probably. But it's another puzzle. It's another pun. It's another double meaning that he needs to unravel to get down here. Um, see, so here's the interesting thing. 
uh, he gets down and finally ends all of this. John ends this, and notice the quotes end. Most scholars believe that Jesus stopped speaking at verse 15, and verse 16 is John. John's now giving the solution that Nicodemus didn't get. So this verse that we always memorize as the key verse of Christianity is a solution to a puzzle. It's a puzzle that the, nobody saw coming from eternity. It, that's what it is. It's the answer to the riddle. How do you get eternal life? And why did Jesus have to die? Yeah, he had to die because that was the way that God was going to provide eternal life to everybody uh, that trusts in him. The John 3.16 is an answer to the biggest riddle of all. And, and it makes perfect sense in the line of this uh, interaction here with, and look at this passage here from Isaiah 52. He didn't see, he wasn't expecting this. He, he uses this term, the Son of Man must be lifted up. This is, this is, of course, a reference to Numbers 21, where Moses, but it's actually a side reference to Isaiah 52. My servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human, and his form marred. Yep, but he will sprinkle many nations. How is, if Nicodemus, if you didn't understand the first part of this from Ezekiel 36, how are you going to understand this? That's the point. And it's so fascinating. And then in, compare this on your own study to John chapter 4, where he's speaking to a Samaritan woman, has no training in the law at all, and he tells her everything. He, he uses similar images, though, in the passage that we're the kind we're talking about. But he doesn't make it at all a big riddle for her. He tells her, I am he, the Messiah, right? And he's, but Nicodemus, you figure it out. Figure it out. Yes. So you're saying, like, the oral tradition that it was written down, right? Is there, like, any humor at all? In, in any, or is that, like, a bad idea to, like, write it down with do you, you mean like people laughing or? Well, like the, yeah. You know, like when you're, when you're speaking, right? Yeah. Maybe five, five humorous things that you do uh, in an hour, right? Right. Does, is there any parts? Is this all scholarly stuff? Or is there any right, jokes or, or humor? Oh, I think the original hearers were probably cracking up. Or they were just puzzled. But I think a lot of times, I think especially the disciples, they probably were laughing, especially when Jesus is like calling the Pharisees snakes and vipers. I mean, I think that had to be really funny to them. But uh, yeah, no, you know, that's where the emotional context of most of these stories isn't part of the narrative. So we can only hypothesize. We, we rarely get that insight from the, from the narrative. Yeah. Howard. So you explained a lot. Here. I know, I'm sorry. And look, we're way over time this time. However, I want to know, what was the fly on the wall that recorded it? Oh, yeah, so... Um, because, of course, we, we see Jesus. Well, and... Yeah, yeah. So, so who, was anybody else there? So there, there, was, there was a question, because uh, at a couple points, um, Jesus uses the plural, we... And, uh, and Nicodemus uses a plural in one point in this discussion. There's a hypothesis that there were some other people that they each brought with them. So, uh, yeah, if you go back and look at... Remember how they did that in the Chosen? Well, in the Chosen, yeah, they had them hiding behind a bush. I saw that. They had them hiding behind the bush, which was... Yeah. Maybe. We don't, yeah, we don't know. So yeah, but he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. So, that, so some people have said, I think a couple of his followers were probably with him also. And it could be a couple of Jesus' followers would have been there also, like John. Um, or they could have been hiding behind a bush, like in, we don't know. Yeah, we're hypothesizing. Or it could have just been revealed to John. Or it could be, or it could be revealed to John. We don't know. That, that part of the mystery of how the Spirit, uh, you know, uh, made all these things come clear. That's the part we don't know. And the reason we don't know it is it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, we would know. Yeah. Daniel? Yes. Sorry. Uh, coming back to the matter of the kingdom and perhaps the two aspects. Sorry I had to rush through that so much because that's so important, but there's no way I can unpack that in this, right? All the way. The kingdom. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so we know that it's going to be the millennial kingdom. That's going to be very obvious. Yes. Yes. And uh, then, as you know, no one can uh, see the kingdom without being born again. 
Right. And then there are those two groups that are born again, those who are living, unfortunately, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, living a carnal or largely ruled by their fallen nature. Hmm. They aren't displaying the kingdom. But those who are spiritual, who are walking in oneness with the Lord, yes. there they can display the kingdom. Yes, and that's what we're... That, he's ruling through them, and as he's ruling through them, they're influencers on the world. Yes, indeed. And yeah, P- Peter, in, in his reference to this, you are citizens of this coming kingdom, therefore live like children of the light. Like th- These kinds of images are throughout. Like We should live like the place that we're citizens of, not the place we're currently stuck in. We're stuck here right now, people. Yeah. Yes? Um, uh, yeah, I'd just be making up an idea, I could, but, uh, yeah, I don't, know. he was healed. He was healed at the end, but there were scars, so, because he showed his scars, um, so he was healed, but I don't know if he was actually disfigured a- everywhere because of that, or if it was just, you know, in his hands and feet, I don't know. Good, good question. Yeah, that would explain if he, but, I mean, just being glorified, you know, yeah, resurrected body, who knows what that looks like, it, you know who? I'm gonna look better than this one day, people. Are you counting on that? Oh, thanks, thanks, brother. You know, I'm. I hope, we're probably all counting on that. You know, so, so you know, maybe he looked even more like the king that he really is in that body. Yeah. There's a thought that that was in Galilee when the when the 500 saw him. Yes. And they weren't in Jerusalem. Right. So. So they were wondering, is it the same? Yeah, yeah, might have been a disconnect. Might it's just question anyway. And how close are you to people at all points in time? You know, when you got a huge crowd around you and they're like, is that the same guy? I think it's the same guy. I don't know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 6, yes. Yes. No, it's okay. And Jesus quotes that when he's explaining why he has to teach in parables, so I'm going to talk about it next week. Yes. Right. Yes. So possibly, uh, possibly there was unbelief. Yes. Because when you believe, then the Holy Spirit comes into you. Right. And that's why we, simple as we are, we can understand what the Word is saying. Yes. I, but I, like, I agree with you. I was thinking about this. Why are the Jews not still um, accepting Jesus as the Messiah when you have all this? Yeah, it's... So, because the Holy Spirit The, the, but the, see, that's it. There, there's a much bigger, there is a spirit of deception in the whole world, and part of it's on the Jewish people, but part of it's on everybody. I mean, look at this world. We're, we're in a world, people need Jesus like we've never seen. And they, some people would rather kill themselves and then look for a solution. I mean, what is going on in the world today? So people are just deceived, and that's, that's a good sign that Jesus is not reigning right now, that Satan has a lot of access, and uh, when he reigns, uh, Satan's bound, and we know in the millennial kingdom. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, it's a bigger problem, but it's right. Why don't the, you think the Jews of anybody, like reading something like Matthew, this would connect all the dots for them? But again, yeah, there's a, there's a hardness on them, and Jesus predicts it, and he says that's why I have to speak in parables because that's the only way I can get through to these people at all. But that's why he uses all these constructions. So as you're reading, Jesus, this will be where I want to wrap this up with you. Just be praying, Lord, Lord, am I being hard-hearted? 
Am I being complacent? You know, am I holding on to something because and let the words of Jesus break through? You know, that that's that's so what his teaching was about, primarily for these hard-hearted people, but that also sometimes is us. So as we read it, you know, always let that be your prayer. Let his words make it through all the way. My defense is down. And that's what he's going to do. Okay, let me close in prayer. If you have any other questions, I'll be here. You can walk up and talk to me, but we're way over time. Sorry. I knew it was going to happen when we get to Jesus. Wow. Okay. (laughs) I knew it. Lord, thank you so much, uh, Lord. And for these uh, men who uh, followed you and recorded uh, these truths and all died for you, Lord, uh, um, we just thank you for what their ministry is because their ministry has crossed 2,000 years into our lives. Um, continue to work through it, Lord Jesus, and continue to speak to our hearts and lead us ever closer to you as lights in the darkness like you were. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay.